All right, guys. So today we're going to go over patellofemoral pain syndrome. This is a common one that'll show up in the clinic and then also on the exam. So let's get into it. So anatomy, what I want to talk about, we're mainly talking about the knee joint itself. I kind of have just, it's it's basically patellofemoral. So that's where the patella is going to articulate with the distal femur. Um, and so we're going to see that it's going to cause some problems along the anterior portion of the knee. They might have pain around the whole knee, but we're mainly going to see the anterior portion of the knee. This is also associated with a higher Q angle. So we see that females tend to have a higher Q angle than males do. And so we're going to see that that Q angle just ends up putting more stresses at the knee, especially valgus stresses at the knee, stretching the medial side of the knee, and then causing tightness on the lateral side of the knee. What we're going to see is that this is going to cause some lateral patellar drift, which then is going to cause some pain at the knee. So we want the patella, like it's on a train track, basically. We want the patella to stay on its, stay in its lane, basically. We want it to stay going up and down, up and down. Because remember, the patella is used as a lever for the quadriceps to make, you know, bending of the knee easier, sliding good, all that stuff. If we start to go off track, it's just going to start grinding on the sides of the knee, causing some pain there at that articulation between our gliding patella and the distal femur. So that's really what is the cause of the pain. So why is the patella going all whack? Well, we can have problems at the hip and at the knee that are causing these problems. As I said before, genu valgum at the knee. So the knock knees, everything going in can definitely cause problems, which is also going to present with problems at the hip. Remember, if there's a problem at the knee, you got to look above at the hip and below at the feet. So mainly we're seeing problems at the hip. We're going to see weakness of the hip extensor. So we're talking about our proximal hamstrings and then our glute max. We're going to see that they're weak, which is causing everything to pull forward, causing us to be more quad dominant when we're doing activities such as a sit to stand. Remember, when you do a sit to stand, you're using your quadriceps to extend your knee, but you're also using your butt, your big hip extensors at your glutes to extend your hips to help you stand up. Because if you just extend the knees then you're just at this bent over position. You have to extend the hips too, using your butt to stand all the way up. So what we're going to see is people with patellofemoral pain syndrome, they're going to be using their quads a lot more when they're doing sit to stand activities or squats. I'm sure you guys have heard that there's been individuals who are more quad dominant when they squat, or maybe they're more hip to our, uh, glute dominant when they squat if they have more of a hip hinge they're going to be more glute dominant if they are just like leaning forward and pushing into the fronts of their knees they're going to be more quad dominant so we're going to see some problems arise when people end up being a little bit more quad dominant um, we're going to see weakness of the hip abductors so abductors and this is because we present a lot of times with that genu valgum at the knee so that knocked knees if we are going to strengthen our hip abductors that's going to put our entire lower extremity in a better position so see this part right here, remember our um, hip abductors are going to connect from the outside of the ilium all the way down to the, our like greater trochanter. So if we're able to contract our glute need and pull us out of this excessive Q angle to strengthen our abductors, we're less likely to go into a genu valgum and we're going to see that the patient's going to be able to have a more normally tracking um hip femoral complex everything um we're going to see that the patient also is going to have those tight hip flexors so we're going to have tight rectus femoris and iliopsoas musculature which again is just pulling everything more anteriorly that's why we're having more pressure through the front of the knees the more we pull everything anteriorly the more pressure we get through the knees um our hip adductors our adductors end up being kind of weak too um, and then we're going to see that our knee musculature at the knee, we're going to have really uh, tight lateral structures at the knee. So what do I mean? Like IT band, um, our vastus lateralis, and then our lateral retinaculum surrounding the knee. So remember, if we palpate our knee on each side of our knee joint, we have our medial retinaculum, which is going to be kind of sensitive because our MCL is right there, and our lateral retinaculum, which is going to be on the lateral part of the joint. Remember, our LCL is lower. It's an extra capsular ligament. We have just our lateral outside of our knee getting really tight. All those tight structures are pulling the patella laterally um, because there's really the only thing pulling immediately is the VMO. So we're going to get into the etiology of this. So Tightness of these lateral structures is really what's going to cause the lateral patellar drift. That's the most common cause of patellofemoral pain syndrome. If we're pulling the patella laterally, we're getting, we're derailing it off the tracks. It's going to start grinding. Again, the only thing holding the patella medially will be the vastus medialis obliquus. Everything else is pulling everything super laterally. Actually, I'm going to pause for a second. I'm going to pull up a good picture that demonstrates this. 
All right, so I have it on the next slide so you guys can look at it. So basically what's happening at the knee is we see our IT band is pulling our kneecap outward. So IT band is tight. Lateral, uh, vastus lateralis is also going to be tight. And just our general lateral retinaculum is kind of underneath the IT band. Everything's pulling the patella that way. Even if you look at our rectus femoris, you can see that the angle of pull is slightly laterally just from the patella going up this way. It's going to be slightly at an angle laterally. And then our vastus intermedialis, again, still same pull. It's going to be pulling superiorly and laterally. So we got one, two, three, basically four things pulling it laterally. What's the only thing keeping it medial? Our vastus medialis obliquus. That's literally, and it's just part of the fibers. Like our vastus medialis itself is just the oblique fibers. That's the only thing keeping it medially. Everything else is pulling the kneecap laterally. That is what's causing it to derail. And that's what's causing problems. So with that being said, let's get into it. So we're going to see that the patella could also drift superiorly or inferiorly, which would be patella, patella alta would be superior. And then patella baja would be inferiorly. Um, we're going to see tightness of the hamstrings, gastrox, and iliopsoas musculature. So we kind of were talking about that. Our iliopsoas up here, those are going to be tight. Those are going to be causing problems. It's going to be pulling everything anteriorly. When we, are, we have tight hips, it pulls things in anteriorly. Um, our hamstrings are just going to be tight more distally at the knee. So they're going to be more bending the knee. So we're going to see themselves, even when we bend the knee, remember um, how the, knee, the femur kind of is gliding anteriorly. Uh, as we bend the knee backwards, especially in a closed chain position, we're going to see an anterior glide of the femur, which is just pushing into the anterior part of the capsule, which is pushing on the patella, going to cause more problems there. So that's what we'll see with the tight hamstrings. Gastrox are just going to put the knee in a more funky position, causing tightness. And then that vastus lateralis, again, is going to pull everything laterally along with the IT band. Um, genu valgum at the knee. So I kind of talked about that before. We're going to have stretching of the um, actually, this picture is better stretching of the medial capsule of the knee just based on the angle while we have a compression of the lateral aspect of the knee, which is going to cause some more pain pushing through, um, causing tightness of the lateral structures of the knee. And so this can be caused by coxa vera at the hip. So remember, if you have co genu valgum, so genu being knee, um, so genu valgum at the knee, you're going to have the opposite happen at the hip. So you could have genu valgum at the, at the knee and then coxa vera at the hip. That's just kind of how the cookie crumbles. It just ends up being opposite or else you end up being like, I don't know, it's like very weird. I remember coxa vera is where you have um, a difference in the angle at the hip. Uh, so it's increasing the angle at the hip. And then also that Q angle, just pushing everything over, causing genu valgum. It's kind of all connected. Uh, activities that can cause patellofemoral pain syndrome are going to be activities that cause uh, jumping or high compression forces. So this is like jumping up with basketball, volleyball, it could even be a goalie with soccer, um, lacrosse, uh, whatever other sports people are jumping in, um, even are jumping in sports for track. Uh, stair climbing tends to be one of those. Uh, that's when people finally come in. They're just like, it just hurts to go up and down the stairs at this point. Like I, it hurt when I was doing activities for school, but now it's just my daily activities are causing problems. So those deep knee bend activities where we're going down below 90 degrees of knee flexion, this can also present with crepitus at the knees. So remember crepitus is just the crunchy sounds, little popcorn kind of sounds at the knee where it's just crunchy. And they're like, Ooh, that's a uh, just crunchy. It just sounds crunchy. Crunchy is okay. As long as there's no pain. Crepitus is fairly normal. I think 90% of the population has crepitus in one of their joints by the time they turn like 22. It's just normal. If crepitus is paired with pain, then that's when we have a problem because that's a technically where we get to the grinding kind of thing going on. Remember, don't just take one symptom in isolation, guys. Uh, we're also going to see that running and other activities that cause tightness of the IT band are going to increase the lateral drift of the patella pulling that way. And so that's going to be what's going to be causing some of that derailing of the patella and that difficulty with the patellar tracking. Um, we're going to see weakness of the VMO or no, that should say weakness. So activities that can cause uh, patellofemoral pain syndrome should be weakness of the vastus medialis obliquus. So sorry, that was a mistype. I will fix that. So our vastus medialis obliquus, I believe I have it correct in the next slide. What does it look like? So this is going to be pain on the anterior side of the knee, and you have to make sure we're differentiating, differentiating it from Oshgood Schlatter's disease. Oshgood Schlatter's would be anterior knee pain with a prominent tibial tuberosity. So that I believe I have a video on this. The prominent tibial tuberosity is because there's constant pulling of the 
quad on the, the tibial tuberosity over the patellar ligament. And so she's going to keep pulling, 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 pulling. And so that's going to cause an increase in bone formation at that site of attachment at the insertion point of the quads. And so that's what's going to be causing an increase in the pain there. So they'll have similar pain with jumping, running, sports, and all that stuff. Oscar Schlatter's is more common in males, though. This uh, patelloformal pain syndrome is more common in females. That's also something to take into consideration. It's still young individuals who are doing athletic things, but Oscar Schlatter's will be that prominent tibial tuberosity. The boards will tell you that. If you see prominent tibial tuberosity, start thinking Oshkosh. And then if it doesn't say that, well, patelloformal pain syndrome is now in the running for what's causing the pain. Uh, again, pain with that jumping, especially landing with high compressive forces, uh, stair climbing. So like also gymnastics is another one that you see a lot of this with uh, stair climbing. So especially when they're going downstairs, they're going to present with a loss of eccentric control. Their knees going to be wiggling all over the place. They're going to have pain, especially because when you descend down steps, you're primarily using the quad eccentrically to pull and that's pulling on the patella swooshing it into the distal femur, which is then going to cause a grinding and compressive forces. And then those deep knee bends past 90 degrees of flexion. Remember, we have the most compressive forces at the knee when the knee is bent below 90 degrees. So therefore, like with deep squats and lunges, you're going to see lots of pain with that. Tightness of the IT band, as we talked before, uh, tightness of the lateral retinaculum at the knee, and then tightness of the vastus lateralis at the knee as well. Again, that's what this picture, everything pulling it to the outside. Now we're going to see weakness. So I have it correct on the side of the vastus medialis obliquus. So our VMO over here is going to be weak. So therefore it can't pull it over. Uh, we're going to see weakness of our glute max and glute med because remember we need those posterior structures to get stronger so we can pull everything off the anterior part of the lower extremity and make it a little bit more balanced and even so that not everything's tight and pushing into the front of the knee. Um, most patients, the patients who are most risk for this are again athletes participating in those high impact sports, women with a higher Q angle, so more valgus kind of deformation at the knee, and pat patients with patellar drift in any directions. Um, with the exception of a medial drift, medial drift is like non-existent because the VMO is the only thing pulling things and you'd have to have like some massively strong VMO to drift it medially. And like most people's IT band can like easily overpower that in two seconds. I think what the IT band can take up to like the fascia of the IT band can take up to like a ton of pressure, like literally like 2000 pounds of force of pressure. Your VMO is never going to contract that. Sorry, no matter how swole your VMO gets not going to be going that way. So again, drifting up, down, or to the outside. How are we treating it? Well, first of all, we're telling them to stop doing whatever's hurting them, especially as they're in the acute flare up kind of stage. Um, we're wanting to use modalities to help decrease their pain. So if we need to use stim or um, they're just having so much pain, that, like throw some ice on there, like something like that, just to decrease some pain. And as they're in the acute phase and tell them to hold off on their high impact sports and deep knee bends, so squats and lunges, um, and decrease exposed or like any other activities that's going to uh, cause high compressive forces at the knee. So just tell them chill for like two weeks, calm everything down. And then within those two weeks, we're going to want to work on strengthening the weak musculature. So our glutes, so abductors and hip extensors, VMO strengthening um, and abductor strengthening. Adductors, we want to make sure they're still strong so they can stabilize. But again, the glutes are more of the thing we want to focus on. If it's like, which one of these should we focus on the most? It's the butt. They got weak butts. They need their butt worked. Um, we want to stretch the tight muscles. So if we have tight uh, hip flexors, we want to uh, tight like stretch those. Our distal hamstring. So again, where our knee bending part of the hamstring is. And then our lateral retinaculum. We want to perform medial glides at the knee. This is something that I keep posting on all my questions to throw you guys off. Do not do lateral glides on anybody. It's not going to help. It's going to make the problem worse. You're further derailing the patella off the tracks. You're literally taking the patella and making it more go off the tracks. What are we lacking? It's not, everything's pulling it to the outside. What do we want to do? We want to push it towards the inside. As we do a medial glide on the patella, we are going to stretch the lateral structures. Those lateral structures are hella freaking tight. So we want to stretch them. So do medial glides, medial glides medial glides. There we go. That's what we're doing. And then stretching the IT band. Um, sometimes the IT band doesn't want to stretch or whatever. So we have to work on some of the muscles that attach to the IT band, like our glutes and our uh, TFL. 
Um, then general interventions to improve patella tracking and decrease pain. So VMO setting, working on pulling it more medially, uh, stretching the lateral retinaculum, medial glides, all of that stuff is all good for this patient. So keywords, we see pain on the anterior part of the knee without any mention of tibial tuberosity. High impact sports that require a lot of jumping are going to probably exacerbate symptoms. Um, we're going to have pain with deep knee bends past 90 degrees and stair climbing, especially with eccentric activity at the knee and eccentric lowering of the quads, weak glutes, weak VMO, tight IT band, tight lateral structures, vastus lateralis, everything's pulling it out to the side, which is causing patellar drift. So we either see it goes too high, patella alta, too low, patella baja, or we're seeing lateral drifts of the patella. The patella will not drift medially. They're not going to magically make up some patient that has a medial patella drift. No, it's going to be one of these. The more common with female athletes based on their high Q angle, and they're more risk to have like genovalgum and deformations at the knee that would cause compression to the knee and tightening the lateral structures. So sample question, everybody. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient with patellofemoral pain syndrome. Which of the following interventions would be least appropriate for this patient to perform? One, stretching of the rectus femoris. Two, sidestepping with band around knees. Three, medial patellar glides. Or four, leg press to greater than 90 degrees of knee flexion. So I will give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so the answer is leg press to greater than 90 degrees of knee flexion. So remember, deep knee bends are not appropriate for this patient, especially when they're in the acute phase. Um, all these other interventions are very appropriate. So stretch the rectus femoris because that's a hip flexor, sidestepping with band around the knees. You know, that's going to burn the crap out of your hip AV ductors. Great work them. I, I'm a little sadistic with my band work and the medial patellar glides, my medial patellar glides. Yeah. Just hear that chanting in your head when you hear a patelloformal pain syndrome, like press to greater than 90 degrees will make them sad. You could do leg press to like 60 degrees of knee flexion, you know, partial range working everything to try to help with that. It's not a bad option. Definitely still strengthening, but greater than 90, that's going to be too much compressive forces at the knee and the patient will be sad. All right, guys, hope that this was helpful. This was a little longer than I expected, but I think I gave you guys a good overview of patelloformal pain syndrome. Take care and I will see you in the next one.